and Brother Jerry will share with us his study on our theme discourse of the context of Ezekiel 12, 18 through 28. And I assume Brother Jerry has a PowerPoint for us, correct? Yes. Is that okay, that? Brother Jerry, go ahead. All right, it should be coming up. Is it on the screen now? Yes, okay. yes. Well, brethren, uh, it's good to be with you. We are very privileged and blessed uh, to be with you and, and uh, certainly humbled by the, by the invitation. And, um, you know, it, it's, um, uh, it's a wonderful uh, study that's been put together for, uh, by the brethren here in, in Ohio for us. And uh, uh, we've really enjoyed the, meditating upon these um, features and how the Ezekiel 12 and, uh, comes into this vision. And uh, it, we're also, you know, very nervous, brethren. So we, uh, we know we're not speaking to uh, just anyone out there. These are the Lord's royal own who study hard and uh, know, know this. And so we appreciate any thoughts you have or any corrections as well. Uh, but thankfully, you know, we're going first. So we get to just give you the periphery, the peripheral vision, as it were. And we leave the deep dive to our, our very able Brethren, I'm sure, have meditated much on these subjects with Brother Wes and Brother uh, John and, and Brother Rick. So uh, we're going to uh, approach this from a standpoint of the vision, 2020 vision, from where the vision is now in 2020. We're going to get to that point. And of course, that it's our spiritual eyesight vision that we're looking to. And um, let me just close my screen here. Our references are from the scriptures, of course. We're referencing reprint 5374 and Ezekiel 12th, and many of Brother Russell's comments. Uh, we, we did, uh, we're very privileged too to speak with several brethren and uh, kind of uh, do a collaboration with them on some of the thoughts here. So we're, we're hoping it'll be a blessing to all we trust the Lord will overrule. 2020 vision, that's the standard for perfect vision. You know, when vision is clear, we're in focus. And we're able to see and discern properly, you know, distances, measurements. But when the vision is out of focus, it needs to be corrected. And it can only be done by the physician who knows how to correct that vision and what to do. In Habakkuk 2.2, it says, And Jehovah answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. Back at 2 3, for the vision is yet for the appointed time. I'm sorry, brethren. And it hasteneth toward the end, and shall not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not delay. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy presence and the end of the age? In verse 45 and 46 says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord has set over all his goods, his household, to give them their meat in due season? So as Habakkuk was told to write this vision, to make it plain, and, we, and also we're told that the vision would speak in the end. And the, the disciples came to the Lord and they said, Well, tell us, when will all these things be, Lord? And the Lord expounds them. He tells them everything that's going to be going on. And he gives them this 2,000 year of events to look to and to be watchful of, to let them know that it's time that's going to pass, that there is going to have to be an endurance and there's going to have to be a trusting and a faith. But then he tells them with these comforting words that he will have, there will be a servant at a time and he'll be able to give them that meat in due season. Blessed is he that. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he hath come, shall find so doing. And the Lord gave and opened those things at the end of the age, at the time, the appointed time of his presence to be, and give that vision and have it speak. And we know that servant was Charles Taze Russell. And we, and we know that Brother Russell, around this time, as he's prepared all these notes, and the studies, and he, the Lord put him with those that had done research, had been studying and 
looking into the pyramid and looking into the presence. And of course, I'm sure he was acquainted with, with Brother Miller and seeking a time of the presence. But it all came into focus at the time of our Lord's presence. And Brother Russell put these things down to make it plain. And so at this time, this reprint 5373, it's right before the one that we're considering uh, for our, our study today. And it's 1914, and he's writing this in January. And Brother Russell's looking, again, he's looking for this vision to speak, and what is it saying? And he knows 1914 is the end of the Gentile times. And he's, he's, in the article, it says this, from every point of view, the year 1914 seems big with possibilities. The headlines of all the newspapers of the world tell that our master's predictions of nearly 19 centuries ago is being fulfilled. Men's hearts are failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth in the present social order of affairs. Evidences multiply on every hand that the teachings of the colleges for the past 30 years along the lines of human evolution and destructive higher criticism of the Bible are bearing their fruitage. Wow, that sounds like it could be written today, doesn't it? With all the different experiences that we're, and the things that we're hearing and the desire to eliminate God, to have a scientific answer for things. It has to be everything else but from a divine creator and each one to be established as their own point of light, their own centered around their own universe. This era of self selfishness is just expounded to our day. Continuing on. The next step in order is a determination to make the most of the present life in view of their uncertainty about the future one. Under such conditions, can we wonder that socialism in its various forms and phases is growing, that a general spirit of doubt and discontent is increasing? Amazing discussions about socialism. You know, Brother Russell felt that socialism would lead to anarchy. And we're hearing these same things going on now about socialism. You know, it, 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 I found this to be very powerful. And, and this next part as well. So long as employment continues at profitable wages, the majority of these people are too cautious to desire a wreck of the social system, through whose operation they have a comfortable living and by whose destruction their comforts might be diminished. The world, therefore, must face the fact that if dire necessities come, as it has done in the past, the common people, the artisans of the world, will meet a situation differently from what their fathers did. Faith in God and the Bible shaken, gone with most of them, we may be assured that a stoppage of the wheels of industry would speedily bring a terrible time of trouble to the civilized world. I, I found that to be so amazing how 106 years ago, when he was writing this and what was going on at that time, we can almost read this in, into the events of our own day today. And that we're seeing just uh, things that happen when the people are upset, they don't reason it out, they don't pray and go to God, they attack one another. We have those scriptures that tell us that it would be every man's hand against his neighbor. So this is the things that Brother Russell was seeing, and he felt this has to be the end. We have to be close. According to the vision and what was going on, expected that kingdom to be set up. You know, we always have to look to Israel. And Brother Russell saw the beginnings of the people coming back to Israel, that the double had accomplished was accomplished, and they were now, Israel, they were returning back. We saw the Pentateuch, and he saw that in his time. And the Lord promised that he would be with Israel, and he always gave them prophets, and he taught them all along the way. He was very patient and long-suffering with Israel. But we know, it was reading Luke 13, 34, and 35, it says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto her. How often would I have gathered the children together, even as a hen gathers her own brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, ye shall not see me until ye shall say, Blessed is he that hath come in the name of the Lord. So there was this promise of a desolation for Israel. We knew, and we're going to, when we get into the Ezekiel, we'll see how this ties in with this from our Lord's words. Amos 3, 1 and 2, he says, Hear the word that Jehovah hath spoken against you. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, 
I will visit upon you all your iniquities. You know, and we, we can go back and we think about how Samuel was very distressed when his, when the Lord, uh, uh, when the people came to him and said, we want a king. And the Lord says, Samuel, it's not you that they're against, it's me. Because the Lord was the one that was guiding them through all these things. And we saw further how as the Lord promised them that they said that they would, they would do all that the Lord had said in Exodus 19. And he said that there'll be, there'll be blessings, there'll be protection if they obeyed, and there'll be punishments for disobedience. The Lord was going to have them as his holy people. And when Israel did not uh, stay close to God in the law, then error, idolatry, quickly crept in and corrupted the people. And as God taught in the law, if they worshiped other gods, then he would allow them to be overrun by their enemies. When Israel returned to God, he delivered them. And that generation was faithful until, until they died. And it would be the next generation then that went into idolatry. And this was repeated and repeated. And you know, we have the picture there of, of Baal. Can you imagine all these heathen religions and these uh, uh, nations that would heat this image up to put the babies in the arms of this this uh, stone, this copper image that would burn the child alive. And the Lord said, I never entered the imagination of my mind and that Israel would want to do and be part of something like this is, is amazing, how they would listen to these false prophets. And that's why when we get into these things though, we see that the Lord said he would punish them. But then there's a promise in Hebrews 6, 13, for when God made promise to Abraham, since he could swear by none greater, he swear by himself. And we know that, that they would be the blesser nation, that they, they would be a people that he would make great, and that there would be the seed of promise that would come through Abraham. And the Lord would give them that desolation and blind them, but he would not forget them. Because we know that in the end, it's, we're told in Amos 9, 11, and 14, in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins. I will build it as in the days of old, and I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel. In Zechariah 14, 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. And when he fought in the day, as when he fought in the day of battle. So we know that the Lord will come again. And that's something we're still looking for, aren't we? That uh, when the, all her lovers leave her. But what a city it is now in Israel. There's no longer, when you look at all the civilizations and civilized governments around them, they... Uh, it's incredible what is what they've accomplished there. They are truly back uh, into that into the land, and they are a thriving city, uh, not to be taken out again. But the Lord, in the meantime, we have to deal with what they've done. They would not follow the Lord's prophets. They sought their own prophets, not sanctioned by the Lord. And in the uh, chapter twelve. We read the first verse. It says, the, the word of the Lord also came to me, saying, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Now, setting the tone for this, remember the ten tribes have gone into captivity. And Ezekiel is prophesying to the people from captivity. Zedekiah is the regent for King Nebuchadnezzar, and we know that Jeremiah is his, the Lord's mouthpiece for King Zedekiah in uh, Jerusalem. So the Lord continues. He says, Therefore, thou son of man, prepare thy stuff for removing, and thou shalt bring forth thy stuff by day in their sight, and stuff by removing. And, and, and uh, thus shall go forth thyself in the evening in their sight, and when men go forth into exile, as when men go forth into exile, do thou through the wall, dig through the wall, I'm sorry, in their sight and carry out thereby. In their sight shalt thou bear it upon thy shoulder and carry it forth in the dark. Thou shalt cover thy face that thou see not the land, for I have set thee for a sign unto the house of Israel. So the Lord is about to give Israel a lesson. And he's with the, the captives there, with Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is doing this thing. He's taking these baggage, perhaps just what he could carry on his back. 
and he's doing this digging through a wall and he's going off. And the people are watching this and seeing him do this. And the Lord meant this for the people to be a picture. We'll continue on in verse 10. It says, Say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, This burden concerning the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel that are among them. Say, I am your sign. Like as I have done so, shall it be done unto them. They shall remove and go into captivity. So the prophecy here is showing that the Lord said the land would be desolate. But the people were thinking this prophecy has failed already. It had been so many years had passed in captivity, and Jerusalem is still there in Judah, and the people are in the land. But the Lord is telling them, no, that it's going to happen, and here's, here is the prophecy. And the prince that is among them shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight, and shall go forth. They shall dig through the wall to carry out thereby. He shall cover his face, that he see not the ground with his eyes. My net also will I spread upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet shall he not see it, though he shall die there. And this prophecy is explained to the people that, ne that Zedekiah, who would rebel against Nebuchadnezzar, would be taken, and the land would be laid waste. All the people taken in captivity. Zedekiah's eyes would be put out. And that's just to say that he would be taken to the land, but he wouldn't see it because he'd be blinded. He received such terrible punishment for his um, lack of contrition where he was supposed to serve Nebuchadnezzar. And the Lord was making it very clear because Jeremiah had told Zedekiah, you need, the Lord is doing this. He wants you to serve Nebuchadnezzar. He has given Nebuchadnezzar the authority. It is God doing this thing. Do not rebel. But he did, and he received this punishment, and all of Israel now went into captivity. Verse 15, and they shall know that I am Jeho Jehovah, when I shall disperse them among the nations and scatter them through the countries. So the Lord promised uh, this, and he wanted them to know, by this thing, you will know that it was by my hand. Verse 20. And the cities that are inhabited shall be laid waste, and the land shall be desolate, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. In verse 21, And the, Lord of the, uh, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is that proverb that ye have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth? And here we get to our key text. 23, Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say unto them, the days are at hand, and the effect of every vision, that the Lord will make it all come true. Not one of his words would fail. And he wanted the people to know that because, you know, it may not happen in their time, but it will happen in the Lord's time. And an important piece here, important feature is time. But also, it's for them to remember that it's the Lord's prophets, not the ones the people select, that speak for the Lord. Ezekiel 12, 26. And again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say the vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he pro prophesies for the times that are far off. Therefore say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, there shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done said the Lord. And we know just a few years later, this prophecy did come to pass. In Acts 7.51, I believe Paul says this, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did. So do ye. So the people that were in captivity had a similar mindset as those that were in Jerusalem. And they felt that they were they were going to be fine. They did not take heed to the either one of the, the prophets that the Lord had given them to tell them what was going on. The Lord wanted the people to know that his words are true and they will come to pass. I am the Lord, I change not. My word will not return unto me void. And the vision will not lie, it will speak, and the words and the visions of the prophets will not return unto me void. The people needed to understand that 
and they have to know that the Lord and his seasons and his times are accomplished and they are as they promised they would do they say everything the Lord says we will do they were out of covenant relationship with him prophecies fulfillment strength and faith sometimes the Lord speaks to us through his prophets matters which seem contradictory and require considerable faith yet subsequently when we see the fulfillment of the predictions these Peculiarities of statement and fulfillment serve to strengthen faith and to convince us that the affairs about us are not occurring haphazard or by chance. But so far as God's people are concerned, spiritual as well as natural Israel, they are all under the divine supervision and guidance. Our Convention text, Ezekiel 12, 23, the days are at hand and the effect of every vision. And what was the reasoning for this and, and causing this to happen to these people? To be told in such a way that, and they had just no belief. Well, you know, Ezekiel talks about this in 22, 26. He says, her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Neither have they caused men to discern between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profane among them. These false prophets and false teachers led away from the Lord, and the people like these uh, sayings. You know, we know about in the end times, as perilous times will come, they'll be taking teachers, uh, pe preachers of itch having itching ears, letting, telling them what they want to hear. And there is no distinction then between what is holy and what is common. And we see that today, don't we? There is no uh, reverence anymore to the Lord. How great that darkness. In reprint 5374, Brother Russell says, during the early persecutions of the church, it was believed that those who suffered would soon enter into glory. They thought the kingdom was near. Some of the disappointed ones continued to wait and hope and pray. Others organized the great papal system and declared that the church should have her glory now, that the kingdom of Messiah was here, and that the representatives of Messiah should sit upon a throne, impersonate Messiah, and bring the kingdoms of the world into subjection. They were evidently led to this by Messiah's not coming at the time expected, and they thought that they must bring about a fulfillment of the scriptures, which foretold his coming and reign. Again, this feature of time and trusting in the Lord and waiting on the Lord. The confusion, the out of focus vision, following the wrong prophets and wrong teachers. Daniel 12, 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh death was set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. And part of this whole vision, from the very beginning, from when Adam sinned, but the Lord promised that there would be a seed, and it would crush the serpent's head. And even to Israel coming after the desolation, they had Messiah come to them. And after this, there was the double that they received. Of, they had double of uh, favor and now disfavor. And now again, back into the land. All these things laid out in the plan and given by the Lord's prophets. And Daniel was told to shut up the words. He wasn't to understand. They were for the time of the end. And Brother Russell looked to these things and looked and saw there to be an expectation. And verse 12, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days, thirteen hundred and thirty-five days. So we know 539 is our date when we have been established as this uh, antichrist system set up. And it goes to 1799 to 1260 years. Excuse me, but Go to the next slide here. And we know that the 1260 days that were prophesied are 42 months, three and a half times, that the papacy was in place. 
and we know that in Revelation we're told, it says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Revelation 12, 6, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God, that they should fear her, feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So the Lord provided for his church, for those that would not bow the knee to, to Baal or give up and had that strong faith. You know, we, we think about how uh, when the priests of Baal came, what a, what a great victory that was for Elijah. But yet he was so afraid when the queen wanted to kill him now for that. And he fled and he says, I'm all alone. I'm by myself. And the Lord said, no, no, I know those that are mine. So as the papal power had their reign till 1799, at the end of the 1260 days, and then we had this cleansing period in 1829, another significant moment. And then that wonderful 1335 days where we know the return of Lord came for the refreshing of all things promised. You know, the papers of that time period when William Miller was talking about the presence of the Lord and the expectations, uh, and then it, they failed. But, you know, I, I believe Brother Russell had a lot of respect for uh, Brother Miller. And, you know, in the third volume, um, he quotes him. He says, we thank God always on your behalf. Our late disappointment has produced in you, and we hope in us also a deep humiliation and a careful inspection of our hearts. And though we are humbled and in a measure pained by the jeers of a wicked and perverse generation, we are not terrified nor cast down. You can, all of you, when inquired of for the reasons of your hope, open your Bibles and with meekness and fear show the, the inquirer why you hope in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Never fear, brethren. God has told you what to say. Do as he bids you, and he will take care of the consequences. God says, say unto them, the days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. It is to me almost a demonstration that God's hand is in this thing. Many thousands have been made to study the scriptures by the preaching of the time. God's wisdom has in a great measure marked out our path, which he has devised for such good as he will accomplish in his own time and manner. What a wonderful realization. But you know, the, the, the Trump must have been sounding for, for Miller to be looking into these things. And, and we're sure the Lord must have been pleased by it. Look what it had accomplished. It woke those up. They were off with the chronology a bit. But it woke the people up to study the Bible, to get closer to the Lord. It had that cleansing effect, to be sure. Seeking the kingdom of head of God's time. You know, once we see that their papal influence, they, 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 they desire to have this kingdom. Vicarious file Dei is the Pope's uh, insignia that in place of God I rule. We saw that they tried to have this kingdom on earth and control the earth. And that failed. And it went down. And then we saw Brother Miller when now with the papal uh, power being diminished, now the scriptures are written in the language of the people and so forth. And we have this wonderful blessings flowing. All those can know about this loving God. But then something else was going on at the same time. We had Karl Marx was talking about this communistic uh, lifestyle and the good of all, socialism. And, he, you know, Vladimir Ilyich, Ilanov, otherwise known as Lenin, he liked Marx's concept and he continued them on. And then we had Lev Devotovich Bronstein, otherwise known as Leon Trotsky. These were all Jews, brethren. Now, whether they decided that, you know, they're not going to wait on the Lord to bring them back into the land and to allow uh, Israel to once be occupied. They wanted to start God's kingdom and help. You know, Karl Marx has a little bit of a background. But, you know, remember, we're giving you a periphery here. We're taking you through, but all the way through, there were those that seeking 
their own glory. There might have been some good intentions here. After Leon Trotsky was on board, you know, Stalin, he turned the communism into a totalitarianism. And uh, there was no, no proper sharing. And that, of course, that's man's mind. It's the selfishness. It's not the time. This is a wonderful thing for the kingdom under a righteous rule. But yet this was tried. And it created oppression, just like in the religious order of things with papacy and the uh, nominal churches. They love that power and that hierarchy and that lording over one another. We know our Lord says, don't do that to each other. That's what the others do. You're not to be like that. But that's all these systems have done. Led, they might have started out with good intentions and pure word, but they ended up to suit the end of the ones who are in power. God's plan of the ages is the vision seen by the prophet Habakkuk, who was told to write it and make it plain upon tables, that everyone may read it fluently. That in the end, the vision should speak and not lie, though it would seem to tarry, yet it would not tarry. It would seem to all that the great plan of God was long delayed. The groaning creation would think the Heavenly Father was very slack. Many would be inclined to lose their faith in respect to the seed of Abraham and to think that God had forgotten the promise which he had made to Abraham. You know, we wanted to bring the, this part in. This is part of the reprint article as well. A famine, but not for bread. It's a subheading there. And when Brother Russell was in Boston, an editor of the Boston Religious Journal said to us on the Monday following our discourse, I was at your meeting yesterday and I saw the immense congregation. I looked it over and said to myself, what is it that brings these people here? I remember that there were uh, seaside attractions, parks, everything to induce people to stay away. Yet on that warm summer afternoon, there were 4,000 present at the meeting and 2,000 that were turned away. We have many ministers in Boston, good choirs, everything to attract. But these ministers at this time of the year have only 40 or 50 at their services. How is it that so many came out to your meeting and sat there for two hours? And Brother Russell responds, and we reply that it seems to us that we are seeing the fulfillment of the prophecy. There shall be a famine in the land, not a famine for bread nor a thirst for water, but for hearing the word of the Lord. We further remark that the people have been feeding on very unsatisfactory nourishment and that they are not satisfied with the chaff that they have been receiving and that they do not go to the churches for the reason that they do not believe in the eternal torment doctrine. We remind him that these people, instead of hearing of eternal torment, now have offered them suggestions from the colleges to the effect that their forefathers were monkeys, that there are large interrogation points in the minds of the people that they are hungry to know the truth. We told him that we believe this accounts for the large number present to hear us, that they were hearing some more rational, something more biblical than they had heard before. So we have everything for which to be thankful. You know, and Brother Russell, as humble as he is, there was a whole different spirit. He didn't uh, gain monies to use to keep for himself and, and to, to have their great coffers built up as many of these systems do. He didn't even put the collection plate out. They were very distraught when he would come because he would never have mandatory collections or tithing. And, and I think when Brother Russell died, I, I hear the story and brethren correct me, uh, you know, maybe during the break if, if I'm wrong, but that he had perhaps $200 to his name you talk about being burned up and emptied and poured out. What a good steward. Maybe enough money at that time to bury him with. But that's the difference between what these systems are, building these big edifices and churches, and all they can attract is 50 because they're, they're, the food that they're feeding them is, is the people are starving. They want to hear hope and be encouraged. You know, after Brother Russell died, that spirit of love and waiting on the Lord and serving one another changed dramatically. The doctrines changed very quickly. The date of our Lord's return, no longer 1874, but 1914. Israel had no share as the blesser nation in the kingdom and the ransom no longer applied to all. 
you know, Adam wasn't coming back. And anyone who heard the word or heard the, uh, of Jesus, if they did not respond, they were in second death. Brother Conrad Binkel resigns over the European operations. And brethren opposing Rutherford, they were cast out of Bethel House. You know, brother and sister Hirsch were young and uh, growing up in the, uh, with Brother Russell. And they were advanced age. And now they were thrown out on the street. But they became chiropractors. And they didn't give up. They were still vital. And they trusted the Lord. And they went out and they carried on. And Sister Hirsch, it's reported that she made this comment. Um, well, we're getting ahead of ourselves. I'm sorry. So our last thought here is that the brethren opposing Rutherford, they were cast out of Bethel House. And the organization became the source of truth and authority instead of the Bible. Independent ecclesias were no longer independent and autonomous as the scriptural model in the book of Acts. Now, taking their direction from the Watchtower organization, they became a hierarchical organization and members attained to higher levels for distributing various amounts of literature. You know, we, we know several of our brethren now who've come out of that system and from the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they told us that they would have meetings and people would say, I'm going to go to 50 houses. I'm going to go to 100. You know, I'm going to work every single day after work, and I'm going to get out there. And it was this competition that was going on. And I heard even stories about those that would go to these wonderful neighborhoods that were people had accomplished so much, million-dollar homes, and they would want to preach the word and hope that the people would not accept Jesus because then they could say, that's going to be my house. What, what a difference of spirit that came upon um, a once beautiful source of truth and the word of God, someone to, to uh, become part of the heavenly family, to a place where error resounded and pride. You know, and our, now finally to our quote, Sister Hirsch, she says, it was as though Satan himself had taken over the watchtower. And that's what it was like. What a difference in spirit. And just so quickly, in, in a matter of a few years, that this all happened. Confidence and trust in the Lord demonstrate your faith. Paramount to making our calling election sure. The Lord wants the people to know that his words are true and they will come to pass. I am the Lord. I change not. My word will not return unto me void. Isaiah 55, 11. It will accomplish what I send it. And the vision will not lie. It will speak. And the words and the visions of the prophets will not return unto me void. What a wonderful promise that we have and assurance. But, you know, Peter, 2 Peter 3, 3 to 5, where he says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So what we're seeing today of those groups, well, we know of a time where it talked about these daughter systems that would be coming together, and they liked what this, the papacy had. They liked that power. And we're kind of made aware of this. Isaiah 8.12, it says, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. You know, the harvest is this time of separating and sifting. But yet they're coming together. There is a key doctrine of the Trinity that holds them together. And now you see all these prominent, once Protestants, as it were, that protesting ahead of the church other than Christ are now seeking to join. And their, one of their visits to the Vatican, they took this wonderful picture here together to show their unity. You know, there was a wonder, an interesting, you know, the Catholic Church had their uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Jubilee, I'm sorry. And, and this was back in 2016. And, and Francis wanted to show his unity. And they, there's this one scene where they, they, he beats on the door. They call it the holy door. And it's opened up to him. And he goes in uh, to be received by the Lord. And he took in each arm 
a Jew and a Muslim, and they walked arm in arm. He brought them in together with him to show this unity. October 22nd, 2009, there was an article, and this is from Pope Benedict, his actions. It says, in perhaps the boldest move of his tenure to date, Pope Benedict welcomed traditional Anglican bishops, clergy, and laity to join the Catholic Church while still retaining key Anglican traditions, including married priests. Under the new apostolic constitution structure, whole groups of Anglicans can move into a local Catholic church that will be headed by former Anglican clergy. In his official response, Australian Anglican Archbishop Hepworth stated, we are profoundly moved by the generosity of the Holy Father, Pope Benedict. May I firstly state that this is an act of great goodness it more than matches the dreams we dared to include in our petition of two years ago. You know, the uh, Crystal Cathedral, uh, Schuller was a the minister there. And he wrote a letter to the Pope and he said, Holy Father, what must we do to come back into harmony? You know, far cry from, from when King Henry VIII wrote the seven sacraments against Martin Luther and the Pope bestowed upon him the defender of the faith. But later Henry VIII started the Sanglican Church. And now we know that the Lutheran Church has joined with the Episcopal Church. And now the Pope has welcomed them back in. So the lines are going away and this unity is coming together. And this is one of those things to expect of the vision at the end. You know, the Christian so-called Christendom has had power for so long. They're supposed to have unity, blessings flowing to all men under their king, uh, kingdoms. But yet we see greed and selfishness is just leading to death and destruction and anarchy throughout the world. It's a bloody, bloody mess. You know, these nations are coming together and the religious powers, we're seeing this rolling together in our day. Many bank, nations are bankrupt. The EU is breaking up. The church's revenues are down. Many are closing. There's an open revolt, people rising up and wanting their rights. Greatest economy of the earth is faltering. The U.S. financial collapse, foreclosures, unemployment, especially now this COVID-19 is wreaking havoc worldwide. The Christian world is spending over $1.5 trillion on defense this year to kill their fellow human beings and to establish this authoritarian power over others. Discontent, general feeling of the masses that their government is corrupt, conflict between rich and poor are more of a probability than ever before. Every man's hand against his neighbor is prophesied. You know, we, when we were thinking about the picture here of those that believe that they are doing God's will, we were reminded of that scene at the wedding and, you know, it, it was an interesting way that the, our, our Lord Jesus told the story. In Matthew 22, 11, 13, it says that when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how comest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away. Cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brother Russell's comments tell us that the wedding garment, Christ's merit, the covering he provides for his own, inferring that he had taken his off, symbolizing a repudiation of the sacrificial work of Christ or a repudiation of our nuptial contract to suffer with him. He was speechless, for he did not come in without it. No one ever came to a knowledge of Christ's presence and other deep things now due to uh, did not have on the robe at the time. He could make no defense. He was guilty. He had him bound hand and foot and cast into outer darkness. The binding, it says, by the Brother Russell's thoughts, by the presentation of the truth and contradiction to the error, the influence being the restraining influence circumventing the error, a duty of all who see the truth. Restraining the influence by thoroughly answering the arguments, 
by putting others on their guard, the restraining their influence on the church. So we coming together, we're doing what we're told, not forsaking the assembly. These are why. We have brethren who are meditating on these things. We have brethren who are going through various experiences. We have literally thousands of years in the brotherhood of, of life experience to draw from, to help one another. Binding hand and foot to take away all his influence. It implies that such may desire to resist and have a preference for their light, for the light, but that none will be permitted to enjoy it except those appreciating the robe of Christ's righteousness and wearing it. Ezekiel 22, 26, we're back to that verse where it says, Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. This also shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it to him. We know that Zedekiah, there was no king over Israel until it was due time for our Lord to come. Acts 3, 19 to 21. Repent ye therefore and turn around, that your sins may be blotted out, that so there may come seasons of refreshing from the face of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who hath been appointed for you, even Jesus, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, whereof God spake by the mouth of his holy prophets that have been from of old. So it's a consistent message that the Lord's given. He's told about his plan. Opportunity to be faithful, to look to the Lord and his leadings. He's allowed and permitted this, his messenger to hear the words of the present Lord, to write it for us. And now we're that Holy Spirit given to us to discern these things properly, to know the time. You know, when we were talking about those religious groups and all those that want to serve the Lord, but they end up with the selfishness, uh, taking power and control and wanting to manipulate what the scriptures teach and hiding it as the uh, great papal system did. They hid the words in, the, in a dead language that no one could read or understand and grow thereby. When King James commissioned that the Bible be written in English. The monks at that time wrote a very interesting tribute to uh, King James at the, at the very front of the Bible. Now, my brother Dan Wessel reported, you know, shared this with me. I believe he heard it from another brother, but he said, you know, look at what they did. When you look at true Protestants and you look at those that were really trying to know, and this is back now from 1611 when this was written. And this is what's in the Bible. It should be in most King James Bibles today. The zeal of your majesty toward the house of God doth not slack or go backward, but is more and more kindled, manifesting itself abroad in the uh, farthest parts of Christendom by writing in defense of the truth, which has given such a blow unto that man of sin and will not be healed. Wow, they recognized the man of sin. And every day at home, by religious and learned discourse, by frequently... Uh, frequenting the house of God, by hearing the word preached, by cherishing the teachers thereof, by caring for the church as a most tender and loving nursing father. And now at last, by the mercy of God and the continuance of our labors and being brought unto such a conclusion as that we have great hopes that the Church of England shall reap good fruit thereby, so that if on the one side we shall be traduced by popish persons, those who had a uh, feeling towards the Pope and papacy, if they are traduced by papist persons at home or abroad, who therefore will malign us because we are poor instruments to make God's holy truth to be yet more and more known unto the people, whom they desire still to keep in ignorance and darkness. What an amazing tribute this was. And, and thinking about the character of those who translated the word. Well, let's go back to the reprint, 5374. Can any good thing come out of the prophecies or anything relating to the second coming of Messiah? These people who proclaim his second advent are laboring under a hallucination. Are not the things written in the prophecies merely fanciful, dreams of men? 
of the rebuilding of Zion and the restitution of Jerusalem? The Lord tells us that although the vision may seem to tarry, that we are to exercise faith, because in the end, it will speak. It will make itself heard and will not lie. It will then be seen to be the truth. The divine plan of the ages is to be made plain upon tables. It will be made so very plain to us that he who runs may read. He who is asleep may not read. He who is drunken with the wine of false doctrine may not read. He who is standing in the way of sinners may not read. But he who runs may read if his heart be teachable and pure. You know, the Lord has demonstrated through time that he only will let sin go so far. And remember what he told Abraham. He says, it's going to be 400 years until the iniquity of the Amorites comes to the full. Well, we know what happened in the world that was. The thoughts of men, it says, in their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord put an end to that world that was. We know that in Sodom, it says, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And remember, Abraham pleaded. He got down to 10, and the Lord said, for the 10's sake, if there is 10 righteous ones, I will not destroy that city. There weren't even 10 anymore. And of course, in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, and the walls of Jericho came uh, tumbling down. It's time to remove them. But there was also a warning given that if you turn from the Lord and did these things, he would do the same to you. The Lord is consistent, but he gives each one. And, and this is evidence that he gave and wants his creation to know and to learn. He gives them the prophecy. He gives them their experiences. He gives the time. He's a long-suffering God because he wants every man to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants them all to be saved. That's what his son accomplished. He wants them to have that pure language, that opportunity. For I am the Lord, I change not, Malachi 3, 6. God only allowed sin to go so far. When his purposes were served, over time, he intervened. Each event, on time at the right time, on time and at the right time, an important piece in God's plan. All scripture for instruction in righteousness. You know, one of the biggest things that our Lord reprimanded and, and the, the scribes and Pharisees was that how they could not acknowledge him. And he said in Luke 12, 54 to 57, says, also to the people, when ye see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway you say, there cometh a shower. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be heat and it cometh to pass. Ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? They were all in expectation. They saw him raise the dead and heard about him raising the dead. They saw him heal the withered man's hand. He saw them cure leprosy and the woman bent over for 18 years. He saw, they saw all these things and it only kindled them to want to kill him. What a different spirit contrary to what we are striving to do and what the Lord taught. You know, one of the key for, uh, important doctrines that we are looking to see is that nation of Israel being left alone. Lamentations 1-2, this is contemporary English verse, says, none of her former lovers are there to offer comfort. Her friends have betrayed her and are now her enemies. And we put that little arrow down there because we, you know there were some discussions that at one point that you know it would that should be the ancient worthies but you know we know that the ancient worthies will show all israel and we know that the nations will take the skirt the hem of a jew to learn of god and they'll they will be the blessed nation and it will be the nation of israel isaiah 42 13 and 14 jehovah will go forth as a mighty man he will stir up his zeal like a man of war he will cry yea he will shout aloud he will do mightily against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry out like a travailing woman. I will gasp and pant together. Reforms will fail and men will take revenge. The systems will melt with fervent heat and it will be impossible to reestablish the present order. 
it has outlived its usefulness. Well, the Lord's given it the time, the iniquity coming to the full. That was from volume four, I'm sorry, brethren. Volume four, page 541 to 549. The same causes that were of the French Revolution are in place today to produce a similar but far more extensive revolution, a revolution which will be worldwide. Every principle of unrighteousness will be involved. In the past, the governments created and controlled all the events. Four families ruled the earth. Nothing happened that they didn't know about. But today, with the World Wide Web, the instantaneous information that's given, governments are forced to react because the people are demanding their rights. They are finding out about the political schemes, speaking out against the financial policies and the flow of truth. Literature is causing great problems for the religious claims. The vision is to be made clear at the appointed time. We may not read the time features with the same absolute certainty as doctrine features, for time is not so definitely stated in the scriptures as are the basic doctrines. We are still walking by faith and not by sight. We are, however, not faithless and unbelieving, but faithful and waiting. If later it should be demonstrated that the church is not glorified by October 1914, we shall try to feel content with whatever the Lord's will may be. What a wonderful attitude. But thankfully, what a, a crash and what a sound did the Gentile times end. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer. You know, brethren, in our day today, we see so many angry things that are happening. The evil that men do one to another. But that's not what we're to do. We are striving to be transformed. 1 Corinthians 4.12. If even so much as a bitter feeling against our traducers and maligners arise, it is to be fought. And so complete a victory gained over it that every fiber of our being will be in sweet accord with our great teacher's instructions. Love your enemies. Pray for them which desperately use and persecute you. Bless and injure not. August 9th manna, Brother Russell says, If the light that is in thee become darkness, how great is that darkness? Matthew 6, 23. The harvest is a time for winnowing the wheat, a sifting, a separating time. and is for each of us to prove our characters, having done all stand. The test of this harvest must be like those of the Jewish or typical harvest. One of them is the cross, another is the presence of Christ, another is humility, another is love. The Jews were reproved because they knew not the time of their visitation. The matter is doubly distressing for those who have once seen the light of present truth and afterward gone into the outer darkness. It implies unfaithfulness. Matthew 5a, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. The human heart as well as the human body has its appetites. Some of the soul's appetites are cravings for sympathy and fellowship, craving for ease and comfort, craving for name and fame, craving for pleasure. Uncontrolled by the other graces has led many reformers into wild excesses, yet under the control of sound mind, the child of God waits for the fulfillment of his promises. You know that beautiful chapter, Matthew 5, all these different levels of character that must be achieved till we get to that point later in that chapter where he says, um, blessed are those when men persecute you and revile you. The Lord is giving us the time to develop that uh, strength of faith. Now we're partaking of the strong meat. And as Paul says, having done all stand to be tested. As you see the day approaching, we go back to that reprint 5373. While watching for the consummation, while realizing that it will bring the time of trouble while seeking to be as fully prepared as possible for whatever share we may have in that trouble. Let us not unduly emphasize the feature of the divine plan in presenting matters to our Christian friends of the world. We have a message of hope and comfort, don't we, brethren? Let us more and more cultivate a sobriety of mind and loving tenderness of disposition, which will seek to tell only such so much as may be necessary to be known. You know, Brother Russell says, you know, he had, some, a brother told his wife all these terrible things and scared her to death. He said, the world knows all about the trouble. Tell them about the beautiful morning and the wonderful uh, promises of the kingdom. Let us emphasize the goodness of God and the great blessings that is in store for mankind and the nearness of the blessing and the grand results to be obtained. Let us tell that the fulfillment of our Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, is close at hand. So, brethren, 
in our concluding thoughts. The Lord has his timetable. Wait on the Lord. That was the message back to Israel. He gave them the prophets to help guide them. And he promised them and gave them these assurances, but they didn't have the confidence. He's given us a guide, the divine plan, a pattern, a role model in our Lord Jesus. But more than that, all of our brethren that are going through these different experiences, and we, we have these wonderful brethren who have gone through the, the, the narrow way all their lives, and we can look to them. All to be followed for the sanctifying work that needs to be done in us. There are consequences for disobedience. Just recompense always. Hear, sorry brethren, that's the wrong hear, H-E-A-R, and obey the word of the Lord. This is the proving time. To obtain to the crowning life, we must be faithful unto death, fully complied to the Lord's will, and none of self remains. And he said, it is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good in his sight, First Samuel 3.18. You know, well, dear brethren, we, we hope that uh, as we covered, as we said, the peripheral vision of the several thousand years here, that we hopefully we covered enough of the highlights and we didn't step on our brethren who are going to speak after us and get that nice deep dive for us to really give us the richness of, of this plan. But we, it's our hope that you would be encouraged that the Heavenly Father has always been there for his people. He allows these things to happen. He's a patient and long-suffering God. He wants his creation. He wants as many that will hear and that will believe and that will accept the truth and take of the waters freely to, to be successful and be in his kingdom that he might be all in all. What a privilege we have to, to know now. The privilege to be called sons, to be made ready for that kingdom, to be part of that great mediator to bless and uplift the whole family of earth. May the Lord add his blessing. To God be the glory.